start at this point. Thank you so much to everyone um, for taking the time to join us today for the training of um, Debris Tracker as a part of the Mississippi River Plastic Pollution Initiative. Um, and so I'm going to give a little bit of context. My name is Jenna Jambeck. Um, I'm a professor of environmental engineering at the University of Georgia. And probably, I guess, our speakers will be me and Catherine Youngblood. She can, uh, she's our citizen science director, and, and she can give a little bit more context then. And then we have Jenny Went um, here with MRCTI, the Mississippi River Cities and Towns Initiative, who will speak briefly after we're done with the, uh, the chunk of the training. Um, and then we have a special guest speaker, which Jenny will introduce as well. So again, thank you all for being here. Um, next slide, we're just going to briefly talk about why we're, you know, looking at plastic pollution. Plastic is a material that um, we find so useful, and because of it, its usefulness, it can be molded into any shape. It can be film. It can be rigid, soft, any additive, any color of the rainbow. Um, it's just increased in use exponentially um, in, you know, the last several decades. And so as of, of 2017, we had produced 8.3 billion metric tons. And because 40% of the plastic that we do use is used for packaging and single use items, that meant that the majority of that had already become waste. Um, and unfortunately, we've just really been overwhelmed by the waste associated with plastic, especially packaging and single use items. Um, only 9% globally has been recycled, and our U.S. rate just went down between 5 and 6% ourselves. 12% um, had been incinerated, but then nearly 80% had ended up either uh, in landfills or just on our land, um, able to produce, pollute our ocean. So next slide. Um, in 2015, we estimated how much was reaching the ocean. Um, and that was 8 million metric tons, which is equal to about um, a dump truck of plastic entering the ocean every minute. Um, we published this in 2015. It was an estimate for 2010. Current estimates um, show this to be about 11 uh, million metric tons and then projected in the next 10 years to um, double or triple if we just business as usual do what we're doing right now. So um, that really implores us to um, take further action, which is a part of, of why we're doing this work. Um, next slide. And in the U.S., our sort of position in this space globally, by the way, happy World Ocean Day. It's World Ocean Day today, and, um, and the U.S. has just committed to reducing single-use plastic in our national parks. There's a press release from the Biden-Harris administration, and that's what we need to be doing. We produce more uh, plastic waste per person than any country in the world. It's typically two to eight times other countries. And so then um, combined with our littering and illegal dumping and then exporting of plastics for recycling, which has reduced most recently, um, we could be ranked up to third in the world in terms of mismanaged plastic along a coastline. Um, and we know that rivers are conduits and how um, plastic can get to the ocean from our watersheds and from our, our arteries, which are our rivers. And so I think next slide shows um, the graphic that's been created as a part of this project, the entire Mississippi watershed, which is 40% of the continental US um, and how that can contribute to plastic ending up in our ocean. So amazing partners, um, the United Nations Environment Program, um, North America Office, and MRCTI, the Mississippi River Cities and Towns Initiative, the 101 mayors along the Mississippi, all have committed to addressing this issue. And we had joined um, later on as uh, the science partner to design um, the sampling program for communities to be able to participate in collecting data, not that communities should be burdened with this data collection, but it really can be empowering and hopefully create change so that we can stop and prevent um, the litter and plastic from ending up in our communities in the first place. So um, the goal is to not have to do this within the future and engage all of the relative stakeholders to um, participate in discussions in this prevention, especially um, corporations and other entities that um, haven't been engaged historically. 
So with that, I think I turn it over to Catherine to talk about um, the mobile app that hopefully makes this data collection easy and really efficient and, and powerful in terms of, of catalyzing this change. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jenna. Yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Marine Debris Tracker app, which is the tool that we are hoping to use to collect this data along the river, specifically uh, now in Rosedale and Greenville, the Mississippi River Delta. So we're super excited to expand um, to this part of the river. Obviously, we've we've done some pilot cities uh, in the in last year, um, but excited to continue to expand this. So as a little bit of background, Debris Tracker was uh, created in 2010 in partnership with the NOAA Marine Debris Program, um, but we've since expanded and are now obviously working on inland areas as well. So here's a quick breakdown of what the training will look like. So we'll go over a little bit of background on what the app is. We'll talk about how to actually use the app. We'll talk about the surveying protocols for this initiative. And we'll also talk about some other ways to collect data. But before I get started, I wanted to make sure you all had this link to breedtracker.org slash Mississippi, which is the homepage where the citizen science guide and other resources live. You can reference those anytime if you have any additional questions in addition to obviously reaching out to us. Alrighty. So first, what is Debris Tracker? So the app is used to collect geospatial data on plastic pollution and other types of litter and debris all around the world. So when you use the app, you're creating a unique uh, geospatial data point. So a point in space and time of exactly where a litter item was. Uh, that's really valuable data scientifically to be able to look at changes over time, to be able to look at why uh, specific things are ending up in specific places. And, and we've tried to make it also really easy to use. The app is free and you can download it on your phone, on iOS or on Android and get started tracking. So today we have over 5 million items logged in over 90 different countries around the world. So it's a really big and expanding database. Um, that said, we a lot of this data historically has been coastal, um, obviously with the focus on plastic pollution being often on the ocean. Um, this is a really big gap that we're trying to fill with this data collection along the Mississippi River of looking at uh, data in inland areas and looking at how rivers might serve uh, to move that plastic into our oceans. All of the data that's logged with the app, all of those 5 million items are available in our open database. So all of this is accessible online. Um, you can search by list. So you'll put in the Mississippi River list and you can search, search by date range and then you'll see the map update with the items. Um, as well as the material types and top items. We've also recently added in a new feature where you can draw a polygon around an area uh, to clip the data to just that area, which is really useful, especially when you're looking at data in a specific community or city. And the goal of collecting this data, so you can see the transects of, of litter data collected on this map on the, on the screen. Um, the goal of collecting this data is really to answer these three big questions. One, what is it? Two, how did it get here? And together, what can we do about it? So obviously collecting the point specific data of recording each litter item allows us to know what it is. By looking at the location about where it is in space and time, we can start to look at those influencing factors around it and start to understand how did it get there. And then after the data collection, we're able to share that back with the communities and able to start conversations on together, what can we do about preventing this data or preventing this litter? And then, so the next section here, we'll talk about how to actually use the app. So I'm gonna play the screen recording, one second. Alrighty, so this is what the home screen of the app looks like once you've opened it up. Obviously the first time you open it up, you'll have to log on and create an account using your email address. Um, but this is what your home screen looks like when you come back to it. You'll click select an organization and then you'll see the Mississippi River Plastic Pollution slash MRCTI list. 
Um, you can click on the list to view those top users on the list. And then when you're ready, you click continue. And that will take you here where it'll open up the list of items. So you can see these are all sorted by category. Um, you can use that collapse all button at the top to collapse all of the categories and then open, uh, expand the categories to view what's in them. So when you're, when you're actually tracking an item, you'll use these plus or minus buttons to change the number if there's more than one. And then you can click add and you'll see the item get moved down here to manage items, meaning that it was recorded. Um, you can also, if there's a lot of items in one specific area, you can actually click on that number and type in a number. So for example, sometimes we might see 50 cigarette butts in one location and it's an easy way to record all of them really quickly. So that's how you record an item. And again, as you're, as you're clicking add, it's creating that unique uh, geospatial data point of where that item is. Another important thing uh, for this initiative in particular is that we're asking people to record the brand data of items that they find. Obviously not every item will have an identifiable brand, but where you can see or recognize the brand, we're asking people to take the time to record that so we know who we need to bring to that conversation around what we can do about this plastic pollution. So if you click on the item graphic, it expands out this description box, and then you can type in the brand, and then when you click add, it will be associated with that data point of that item. So you can see how that works there. Another important thing to note um, is that there is a category called other. So um, there's an other for all of the different material types as well as an other other if there's something that doesn't fit in, in any of those material types. And you can use that same description box to type in an item um, and describe what it is that you're seeing. So I definitely recommend that before you go out in the field, take the time to read through all the items and just familiarize yourself a little bit with what kinds of things um, are options to record. And then if it's not available, you can always record it as other. So we've worked with local organizations to curate this list. So it does capture most of the things you'll see in the field, but there might be some other uh, things that we, we didn't account for or that just aren't very common. Another thing to note is this accumulation area. So this is um, basically a way to record hotspots. So sometimes uh, we might see things in the field like large um, areas where there are a lot of litter that might fall outside of the, the zone of where we're actually tracking and recording all the data. Um, for example, this could be in a an uh, informal dumping site. It could be an area where there's a lot of trash built up in like a canal or a creek bed. Um, and so we're asking people to tag those hotspot areas so we can keep track of where those are and then use that description box to estimate the length and the width. Obviously this is just a visual estimation, but it still is really important to give us an idea of where those hotspots are and how big they are so we know um, resources that may need to be targeted to address those as well. So you can type in the, the length and the width and feet, and then you can click add, and that will also be uploaded to the database. Another item is the test item. Uh, this is really uh, an item just to allow people to play around with the app before you're actually out in the field. So I definitely recommend uh, if you're if you're going to submit data before and just do a practice, use that test item so we don't mess up any of the, the data in the database. Another feature that is my favorite feature in the app is the favorite section. So this is a way to pin items to the top of the app. Um, so you just hold down the add button and you'll see those items get pinned there at the top in your own customized favorite section. And all you have to do to remove those items is to hold down the add button and then that will be removed from your favorite section. I like to set up this favorite section at the beginning when I'm first starting to collect data in an area and put the things that are really common, like cigarette butts, bottles, food wrappers, all in this section so that I can find them really easy and don't have to scroll or search through the app to try to find them. All righty. So that is a basic run through of how the, the favorites and the searching works. And then if you click manage items, you can see uh, what those items that you've logged look like. 
um, because this is a test, I'm going to remove other items. If you log something accidentally, you can use this manage items tab to remove those items. So I'll just leave the test item before I continue to upload. Um, another important thing to mention is this survey. Um, it has some additional questions that allow us to collect some really valuable data on where uh, the litter was collected that are really helpful when we go to try to analyze the data and look at those influencing factors on why that uh, litter was ending up in the environment. You can also add images to a log. So this is completely optional. You don't have to do it, but if you do take photos of interesting things while you're out tracking, um, you can upload them here. And then you have two options here, one upload session and two upload later. So the app actually works completely offline um, if you use the upload later button, as long as you've opened up the list before and loaded all the items, you can track offline and then use the upload later session, upload later to save it. But if you do have service or if you're on Wi-Fi, you can use the upload session to go ahead and submit that to our database. Um, you'll see it spinning as it tries to upload and then you'll see a green check mark that means you have completed that data upload and it's in our database. And I'll go back to the beginning really quickly here just to show you as well. So uh, this, if you do use the upload later feature, it goes to this little cloud and you'll see that one there. So you can click on that and then click upload to upload it later when you do have access to Wi-Fi. So that's a, a quick run through of what the app actually looks like. Um, lots, of, lots of things to consider maybe, but really you're just, clicking a button when you see an item in the environment and then uploading it to our database. That's, that's the basics of it. So let me move forward here. A couple of things to consider in terms of setting up uh, the app. You do need to enable location sharing while you're using the app. Um, as I said, the app is pinning specific locations of where you're finding litter items. So we need uh, access to your location in order to do that. Um, if you are going to share photos, if you're going to upload photos, also include that um, enabling photo access. But again, that's completely optional. We don't use your location or your photos for anything besides what you upload to the app. All right, so now we'll jump in from this, from the actual concrete how to use the app to the surveying protocols. So um, we've talked about a lot of these already. This is a page from our citizen science uh, guide, which um, is available on our website. But one important thing to note here is that we're really focused on items that are over about an inch in diameter. So I like to use like anything bigger than a cigarette butt. Um, so a cigarette butt or larger, you can log those things, but you don't have to record every teeny tiny fragment. Um, another thing to mention is that if you see an item that's fragmented, like a piece of a chip wrapper, you can log it as what it originally was. This will allow us to um, have a better idea of what the source of those items is, is coming from. So we've developed maps for both Rosedale and Greenville that identify some priority sampling areas within the community. So this is an example of one of those maps. So these uh, small yellow squares that are outlined in red are um, our priority sampling areas where we're asking people to go collect data. So these have been randomly assigned throughout the community uh, to distribute and break up where people are collecting data we realize we might not get data collection in all of these, and that's okay. The goal is to uh, just enable people to be spread out and have sampling areas that they can go conduct transects in. So here's what a transect actually looks like. Once you arrive on a, at one of those priority squares, you will pick a litter aggregation pathway. So any space that's safe to walk along a road, along a sidewalk, a pathway in a park, um, and you'll follow, you'll estimate an area about three feet or one meter wide, which is about the length from your outstretched fingertips to the center of your chest. So you'll estimate an area about one meter wide and you'll follow that uh, line of the road or the sidewalk for about 20 minutes collecting data. So we originally had 30 minutes and have actually updated this in our most recent version to 20 minutes because we realized um, people were actually collecting really long transects. So now we are, we're only asking people to collect 20 minutes of, of data. Um, and 
now I'll talk about other ways to collect data. So this, this transect method is really the, the gold standard. It allows us to look at influencing factors in a geography. It allows us to look at density because we have a measure of approximate area based on the, the geo, geographic data. Um, but there are a lot of other ways to collect data that are all really valuable. So opportunistic is also uh, an, an option. So you can track anywhere, anytime. We have a lot of people who track while they're out walking their dog or while they happen to you know, be in a park. You're, you can collect data at any time. And all of this data is really valuable for building a, a characteristic picture of what's um, happening in the community. If you're going to do a cleanup, for example, um, we recommend the, the, the kind of best option for that is to track in pairs so that you can track the items as you clean them up. Um, we do also have groups who record, um, record everything in an area and then go back and clean up the area. So that's another option. And then we also have groups who um, might uh, take everything from a cleanup, bring it to one central area, and log it on site. Um, again, all of this is uh, you, this is um, valuable data for understanding the characteristics. So I wanted to show this as an example. Um, this is an example of an island off the coast of Belize where they're collecting a lot of small plastic in the tide line there, and they are bringing it all back and logging and sorting it in one central area. So we don't get that point by point breakdown of what's happening along the tide line but we still get a really um, useful breakdown by category of understanding what those different items are. So again, um, we'll use the, the, den the litter transects to understand density in a community, but uh, this uh, aggregated data is still really helpful for understanding top items and categories. And then finally, there's one other option for, uh, aggr for uploading data after the fact, which is our manual upload feature on our website. So when you log into our website, you'll see on your account an option to manually upload data. It works very similarly to the app. You put in the, the number and the, the item and click add. The main difference is that at the end of this, um, you will pin the location on a map and it'll just have one centralized location for all of those items that you collected. I'll also reference that we have our guidelines for uh, safely tracking litter available in our field guide. The main thing to mention here is that you don't have to clean up while you're collecting uh, data. It's uh, something that a lot of people uh, do. I think we had about 80% of people who participated in our previous sites who collected the uh, litter that they were tracking, but it's not a requirement. So if for whatever reason you don't feel that you can safely clean up while you're collecting data, that's not a requirement at all. You can, you can record data with the app without cleaning it up. And there's a question on the end of the survey that asks whether or not you cleaned it up. Um, so we can keep track of that in our, in our data set. Lastly, I'll just show this map of the river, uh, the Mississippi River Basin to kind of get an idea of how, how big the scale is in the, in the US. Uh, those yellow points there are points of data that were collected in 2020 along the river. Uh, last year alone with our, our new pilot cities along the river, we had over 100,000 uh, litter items log. So really growing and expanding this data set in a way that's super valuable and allowing us to understand how the river is serving as a conduit to move plastic pollution and other types of litter into the ocean. So excited to expand this into the Mississippi River Delta and uh, into Rosedale and Greenville. And I will stop there for any questions. Looks like we might have some in the chat. I haven't checked it. Maybe just links. Okay. I think I addressed most, yeah. And I put in all the links to, that you mentioned, including Perfect. To both. In that so. case, we'll turn it over to Ginny. Thank you, Catherine and Jenna, and welcome everyone. I hope that you were able to gain some good information from that training. And like Catherine and uh, Jenna said, this will this is being recorded or it has been recorded. So you all should have it. I'm gonna share my screen, screen real quick. Um, oh wait, I can't, Catherine or Jenna, if you can let me share my screen, I'm gonna share the flyer. But I did want to just point out that this Saturday is the launch event in Greenville. And then um, 
So hopefully you all can make it. It starts at 10 a.m. Uh, for a breakfast, um, noon for a press conference, and at one o'clock we'll do some data collection around Greenville. Um, but this right here, just to make sure you all know that the data collection we're asking for goes through July 17th. So even though the launch is this Saturday and we want as much data as we collected as we can, we want data collected through this whole month. Um, we're not expecting everybody to get to all those squares at the same time on that day. And so uh, if you all haven't seen this, I'll send it out again. But basically, you know, we want everybody to get the debris tracker downloaded on your device, select the Mississippi River Plastic Pollution MCTI list. And there is that Mississippi River Citizen Science Guide, which um, Jenna uh, put the link to the webpage that has that information on there. Um, so, and with that, let me stop sharing. I would like to introduce Angel Bradford. Angel is a wonderful human, one of the best I've ever met. Um, a little bit about her. She's gonna talk a little bit about um, environmental justice. Uh, Angel was born and reared in Baton Rouge, and upon return to Louisiana after college, she spent much of her time rediscovering her love for the people and land there. The past few years have been filled with opportunities to educate at the university level, advise undergraduate students in their environmental commitment work, and to continue her own education through organizational and civic responsibilities and through formal training as a cardiovascular doctoral student at Tulane School of Medicine. Climate work in Louisiana is massively difficult. Political organize, organizing and strategizing just the same are difficult, but Angel feels she is destined to walk down this path. And every interaction, kind word, and each moment of levity keeps her grounded in her purpose to spread compassion and joy while doing her part to shift the ugly systems and habits communities have held onto for generations. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Angel. I'm so glad you're here. It's always great to see your face. It's so good to see y'all. I'm also like, where did I get that bio from? <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I love yeah, it though. I, I do love it. I found it. I was like, I'm definitely reading this for Angel. Well, thank you. Um, but yeah, okay, so I just will talk about environmental justice work. I, I, so um, just as a refresher, I'm in Louisiana, I'm in South Louisiana, um, uh, and spend most of my time in New Orleans or in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And of course, in between those two cities are a lot of the environmental justice, quote unquote, fights. Um, but of course, my definition, so I will say that I think historically environmental justice was people think about like, you know, pollution of communities or polluting in communities with petrochemical plants or oil and gas plants. But for me, climate change kind of inherently is about environmental justice. And it's really hard for me to piece those two things apart. Um, just because someone or something or some environment is always being harmed in this process of climate change. Um, and so a lot of folks um, that I've worked with in Baton Rouge kind of came into this work through waste reduction and plastics and litter campaigns. Um, and I think it's mostly because in a lot of ways, people didn't realize that the plastics that we use every day and the styrofoam that we use every day is also bad for our health. And so anytime I'm like, hey, like you're micro, you know, microwaving that styrofoam, someone will freak out and be like, oh, I had no idea that there are so many bad chemicals in those materials. And that's always a conversation starter um, and kind of buys people into the work really. Um, but the reality is that the plastics and the waste that we have, a lot of them are almost eternal. Styrofoam takes a really long time, if not infinite amount of years to break down. And in that process, not only is it polluting land, air and water, but also us and the food that we eat. Um, and other plastics do the same thing. Um, they're what they call carcinogen are made with carcinogenic material, which is cancer causing material. Um, and so kind of how I've come at environmental justice work, whether it's a fight in South Louisiana around plastics plants or petrochemical plants is to recognize that every single thing that I use or I touch or that we all collectively use or touch has a consequence. And so I just try and be mindful of the full life cycle of everything that I own 
um, and not just like throwing everything away instantly because now, you know, there's tons of stuff we all have that have flooded our communities like plastics um, that we're kind of like stuck with. And so how can I maximize its use or make sure it's properly recycled if it's the right numbers? Um, and then how can I just reduce uh, like my clothes even? I'm like, I have to do 100% cotton now or, you know, buy less things or, you know, go to thrift stores. And so just like, it's a lifestyle change for individuals. But of course we know that in Louisiana and Mississippi and all of our states that, you know, are touched by MRCTI and the work that y'all are doing or we're doing together, um, that we have to also hold the corporations and the businesses that produce these things accountable. And so I think with this amazing launch that y'all are having this weekend, it's the start to the conversation of how do we stop producing these things so people like us don't have to figure out what to do with them. And Jenny, do you have any questions that I should go off of? Or does anyone have any questions or thoughts? Well, I just want to make a point that um, I'm currently working with Angel on a big EPA grant in the city of Baton Rouge because we did this data collection and got this kickstarted in um, April of 2021. So it's only been a year and we were able to use that data and now we're working with some of the um, underserved communities in Baton Rouge that do have, um, you know, haven't had those access to those resources because we were able to get this started. So that's something that you all have um, the potential to do as well. And it's, and it's huge. It really is. It's like, you think that you're not you can't do much as an individual, but just getting this started really does. Um, Angel, if you want to talk a little bit about um, like accessibility and why um, underserved communities um, might have their choices they have for um, packaging and um, just in general uh, environmental uh, sustainability. Yeah, for sure. So I volunteered a lot with Ginny and students, college students in North Baton Rouge, which is the more underserved part of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. They also have a historically black college and university called Southern University, um, which I'm sure some of you have heard about because <laughs> JSU is our kind of our, but I know you're not in Jackson, but anyway. Um, and so basically a lot of the college students were, you know, very bought into like, how can we get recycling and all these other opportunities going? Um, but I think what this work has shown is in a lot of these areas, because there's not a lot of financial investment, that it's been harder to get businesses and universities and schools the resources they need to get out of plastics. And so not only are these areas where there's like 10 or 12 plants we can name in this area that produce plastics in some way, shape or form or produce it as a byproduct, and so it kind of just floods the community. It's at the convenience store, it's at the grocery store, if they have one, um, it's, you know, at every restaurant, it's not a lot of materials that, you know, some companies across the country are starting to do reusable models. And so you could theoretically rent, you know, a container and bring it back every time you want to go to Chick-fil-A or something. Uh, but, um, or whatever local restaurant, honestly, because I'm sure I shouldn't use Chick-fil-A as an example. But um, in North Baton Rouge, those kind of innovative ideas outside of like our group that's hopefully bringing this strong coalition that provides alternatives, um, folks are just left with tons of litter, tons of plastics production from and pollution in their areas, and then not a lot of options outside of that. And so I think what's good about the university students and then what Jenny has brought to our world um, from MRCTI has been this idea that perhaps we can move away from relying on plastic packaging for every single thing that we use. And even our meetings have become no waste meetings. And so we're trying to get into a habit of everyone brings their mug or everyone brings their plates. And it can be really hard. I recently had a party with my sister and that was waste, that was waste free too. And it was actually hard because companies have so much incentive to just, even our venue was like, well, you should bring plastic back up. And so we're also kind of addicted almost to plastics. That's so just having that moment to start planning and thinking about the society we want. And North Baton Rouge is kind of a, like a miniature, um, like testing opportunity of just like, like 
how can we design communities where people can actually have fully renewable, you know, resourced or reusable material in all parts of their lives? Um, uh, Jeremiah, I just saw a, do you wanna go ahead with the conversation with um, Angel? That was from you. Yeah, sure. Um, I just wanted to ask because one thing that our um, students who are making a documentary have been thinking and talking a lot about is like the way that there's a negative feedback loop between unsafe drinking water and plastic use and disposal and then like a reciprocal relationship between those two. And I don't know, I was wondering if, if you could maybe talk about how that comes up in your work or how you see that in Baton Rouge. Um, and yeah. How yeah, absolutely. And thank you for that question. Um, so, it, and it's a timely question. So a lot of the petrochemical industry or companies in Baton Rouge use the same drinking water as the people of Baton Rouge. And that's actually kind of a huge fight right now of how can we get industry off of the water that human beings and communities are using because not only are they depleting it, but in the petrochemical process, they're also uh, contaminating and adding salts um, to the water. So it's damaging the quality, but also what they call the salinity of the water. And so the concern for places like Baton Rouge is that their aquifer will be fully depleted or contaminated within the next 30 years. And so, yeah, it is this kind of awful feedback loop of not only using the water for plastic production, plastics pollute the water when you dump them um, or their byproducts into the water. And then eventually that plastic's gonna end up in either the Gulf of Mexico or Mississippi River or something. And so it's kind of, it's a disaster because we all know that plastics break down even if they don't um, fully biodegrade. And then those end up in animals and in people and cause all sorts of health problems. Uh, for the ecosystem. And so plastics themselves just have to be eradicated. Any other questions? And that was a great one. Hi, Angel. This is Sam Washington with the Greenville Mid Delta Airport. Uh, just curiosity for me, uh, uh, the, and I guess, uh, Jennifer, I guess you all can chime in on this too. In terms of the amount of plastics that end up in the uh, water systems. Uh, are, does this account for landfills as well? Or is this just this just the stuff that's just like thrown out on the street, thrown out in the field? Uh, it, where, where do these numbers come from? Is it all of that or is it just the stuff that doesn't go to the landfill? I believe it's all of it, but Jenny, you'll speak to this better than me. Yeah, I actually am gonna pass it over to Jenna. Um, okay. But I don't think it said what's in the, I, no. I'm just going to shut up, Jenna. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. What we're what we're talking about um, in this case is just what we would call mismanaged waste, the so waste that's not managed in our formal system. Um, when we're talking about the characterization of the litter, now what might be confusing is I did give some context slides that just talked about the quantity of plastic waste that we generate. That was everything, including what goes into landfills and whatnot. Um, but for this work, what we really look at is, is what's leaking out of that system. But what's leaking out is a percentage of what we generate. So in a way, as we have this discussion, when I reference the fact that in the US, you know, we, we generate more plastic waste per person than many countries in the world, almost all of them, um, that's why we kind we we start to want to look at reduction for ourselves because typically that leakage is a percentage of what we're generating. So, I mean, the best waste is no waste, um, and and so instead of trying to fix all the management because we really have a a good management system, but we but well, it's good in that it's supposed to be reaching everyone, but it doesn't really work for everyone. And I think Angel's really highlighted the lack of access that people have to alternatives. Um, and we all sort of have to operate in the system that we're given right now, which doesn't seem to be working, even though it's designed, I guess, to access everyone is, is what I would say. So anyway, I hope that answers. Mm -hmm. I do, I'm gonna just um, give a statistic and you probably already said it, I'm sure you did, but. So in uh, this is 2018, we produced 
300 million tons of waste, municipal waste. So I don't even know if that includes commercial waste. I'm not really sure. Maybe it does. But okay, 300 million tons. So even if our waste systems and our, our um, trash and recycling services and landfills are 99% leak free, that still leaves 3 million tons annually that enters our environment. So a lot of people point their fingers at people who are littering and that is a major problem, but it's not just that. It's just that we have so much that's hard to manage at all. And there is another question um, for you, do you see it, Angel? Yes, so how has the pandemic changed plastic consumption in the nation or Mississippi, Louisiana? I don't have the numbers, but I do know that it's horrible <laughs> um, because even everywhere and like even New Orleans, I consider one of like the best places I've ever lived or um, worked in that allows you to just bring, like you can bring whatever you need to eat or consume or whatever. And all of that stopped. And so there was no more use, like reusable use of cups or glasses. And some companies I've noticed have permanently gone back to plastic because there's a misconception that plastic is um, cleaner or um, safer when it comes to COVID. But the truth is, if you wash your dishes as you should during flu season, you should also be washing your dishes during COVID and it shouldn't be a problem to use um, reusable materials. And so plastic consumption is definitely out of control, plus masks um, and then all the takeout that we did. And so there's I feel like there's a lot of gains that were made prior to COVID that have been reversed because of that. And I can and add a little data point, uh, yeah. Angel, you're absolutely right. Um, that uh, now in our litter, in these transect methods and through this data collection, we've seen that masks, wipes, and gloves, which are kind of the main PPE items um, that are logged through this are one to 2% of the litter now, like consistently across the board in all the cities and in all the places. And, that, and it was zero before, and now it's one to 2% of what is found. So almost every transect um, you know, every time you go out on a tracking session, you'll either see one to two of either a glove mask or wipe. And it's it's just consistent as we collect this data everywhere. Yeah. And it's devastating because there, like I work in a lab and there are ways to sanitize and reuse. And, and I get that like in the heat of COVID, like we had, we were making all these decisions very quickly and had to get the science out to people very quickly, but now we do know better. And there are materials that even my own lab don't need to be plastic. They just are for convenience. And so it's like, how do we get back to like being more mindful about the things we use, whether it's, you know, medical waste, which I know gets, you know, to be a very difficult conversation around plastics um, and then also just everyday items that we use. And just something that, you know, here in St. Louis that happened right before COVID, we were getting really far at um, educating folks on reusable bags and pushing that reusable bags and working with restaurants and, and um, businesses to, to promote and incentivize reusable bags. And then COVID came and everyone's like, oh, we have no more reusable bags. You can't recycle them, which was we know now is not true. But that's something you all, um, you know, individually, because I do it as much as I can, but boots on the ground going and talking to uh, businesses is, is very effective. It's, it's more effective than anything else when it comes to getting people to realize, okay, we're not buying that, that a, re, a single use plastic bag is better. No, we need to be able to um, save those resources. Absolutely. Uh, Angela, one other question. I uh, I don't want to keep everybody over their time. Uh, what what kind, if any, uh, pushback do you get maybe from the public and from business to say, well, we would do recycling, but we don't even have the the infrastructure or the or the the locations in place to do that. Uh, what have you seen in terms of the, uh, of combating this? What kind of pushback, if any, have you seen from individuals and organizations that just say, well, we'd love to do it, but we just can't? Yeah. So I will say that the Louisiana business and industry folks, for sure, like the lobbyists, 
um, made sure to kill a bill in the legislature, actually, that would have implemented like a ban on um, items that weren't recyclable. Um, and so there's a strong lobby that's making sure that misinformation continues around why we quote unquote need plastics. That's one thing. But the biggest thing, of course, is money. There's it's always like, oh, well, if we went reusable or if we recycled, it would cost us more money. And my response is always, and yeah, it might be radical, but like, first of all, we can pay people to do these jobs. Like you should be well-paying jobs, uh, helping to, a business to recycle. And also local governments and state governments could be subsidizing those wages, especially with all the excess federal funding, which, you know, since we know that plastic waste increased after COVID started, um, it is COVID related outcome. And so you could cover um, excess federal funding and like start building reusable economies and circular economies into um, state institutions or agencies and then help those businesses out. But the conversation kind of stops at, oh, we can't afford it. We, and a lot of the municipalities make the businesses pay for recycling, even though the residential houses, not apartments, um, automatically are kind of enrolled into recycling. And so it's not equitably accessible to all these small businesses, first of all, but also, they don't make it easy at the municipal level. And so these are like barriers we have to remove in order to help businesses realize this is possible, whether it's recycling or reusable. Okay. And thank well, you, Sam. Me, definitely giving me something to think about. I'll make sure I have my cups from now on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and y'all... Um, Angel is amazing because, you know, she got her undergraduate, was teaching, was part of the Sierra Club at Southern University, really has just done amazing work in Baton Rouge. And now she's going to get her PhD at Tulane. So um, it's a lot. I don't know how she does it, but it just shows that it, you can do it even when you don't think you have time or, oh, I don't have the energy. And sometimes we don't. And sometimes it's, you know... <laughs> it's hard to do, yeah. but, you know, having that, um, that drive and, and you make, and you make progress and that's, that's critical. So. Yeah. And, and thank you, Jenny, for what you just said, but also like, thank you for inviting me and y'all, this is, it's been great to hang out with y'all and I will love to visit, um, your towns whenever Jenny comes to visit me and picks me up and I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's a good note to circle up on because um, several of us will be in person in Rosedale and Greenville um, starting this Friday. And Jill, wish you, wish you could be there too. Um, would love to see you again. But the, um, yeah, so, so I will be uh, there on Friday and meeting um, with the Rosedale Freedom Project in person Friday. Look forward to that and, and seeing everybody then at the launch event on Saturday. And Jenny will be there. Um, I don't know if anyone else on the call, uh, besides, of, of course, all of you locally, we look forward to um, meeting you in person. So, um, Asia, when the, this recording will be available pretty soon, so I'm recording it to the cloud. Um, it's basically as fast as my internet works. I have to get it out of the cloud and then um, back into, usually we put this up on YouTube. But, oh, Catherine, there was a... Um, training that we did yesterday at um, the end of the day. I was not able to be a part of that one, but um, that was recorded and has already been posted to YouTube. Catherine, is that what you just put in the chat, I'm guessing? That's it, yep. Okay, so there was a recording, so it should be very similar in terms of the training that's available, but we will um, we can share out this recording um, as well. So it's just a little bit of internet logistics, but within, 24 hours at the absolute latest, um, I would say that we can post this one as well. Thank you all. Um, yep, we're, we're at our time. So we'll go ahead and wrap up unless there's anything else, uh, Jenny, Angel, or Catherine, or anybody. No, uh, we'll see everybody this Saturday, um, probably who's on this call except Angel, and I'll be in Baton Rouge soon. Need to make some plans to get, get back down there. Sounds good. All right. Have a good Thanks day. Thanks, all. Thank you. We'll see you Thanks soon. All right. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.